Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. You hear a doctor talking to a patient. Well, I've got these skin problems which seem to be getting worse. At first, I thought I had dermatitis or maybe even a fungal infection. I'd had something like that as a child. Then I started noticing these thick red areas on my skin. They're sort of a little raised, I guess. Mm -hmm. They just got worse and the affected area got bigger and bigger all the time. I was a bit worried that it might be contagious, you know. I was worried I'd picked up something from one of my young nieces. I see them quite a lot. And these patches are? They're mainly on the outside of my elbow and over my kneecaps. Oh, and on my neck. Right. I've been wearing long-sleeved shirts and jeans to cover them up, but I can't hide those, so everyone can see them. They're also very painful. Sometimes it feels as if my skin's burning. It's very itchy as well. I try not to scratch it, but it's almost impossible, especially at night. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's so bad that I find it hard to get comfortable and I can't sleep. It leaves me tired most of the time, and that has an impact on my work during the day, quite apart from the embarrassment of the symptoms themselves. Um, I'm a tour guide, you see, so I'm very much in the public eye. Yes, I imagine that it's been difficult for you. Have you tried taking anything? Well, I tried to fix the problem myself at first. I bought some cream from the pharmacy to see if that would help. Uh, sorry, I, I can't remember what it was called. That's OK. It didn't do any good anyway. So I tried a non-allergenic soap, mm -hmm. but that didn't make any difference either. I just want to get something which will clear this up. Mm, yes, I understand. Are there any other health issues I should know about? Maybe when you were a child? Uh, not really. I used to get acne as a teenager, but no worse than anybody else. And it cleared up by itself, really. At the time, you're very aware of these things, aren't you? But I haven't had any other problems like that. But there was something else that I didn't tell my GP about. I'd forgotten about it because I hadn't been to see her about it. I went away on holiday with a friend the summer before last and we managed to pick up scabies from one of the cheap hostels we stayed in. Right. I was covered in a rash. It was extremely irritating at night. Now I think about it, it was all over my body, especially around my midriff. It looked like I was covered in little pimples. Fortunately, we got rid of it using a lotion from the pharmacy, but I never mentioned it to my doctor. I see. And any other health problems? Oh, I did have a bladder infection a while ago, um, last year I think, but I haven't had any problems since then. Do you think that could have caused my current problem? I shouldn't think so. You're probably aware that this is quite common, and I noticed that your GP sent away a urine sample for testing before referring you to me. The results are quite normal, so I wouldn't be concerned at all. Well, that's something, I suppose. OK. Well, as you say, it's different from your current symptoms. What about the effect your current problem is having on your general mood? I'm just sick of dealing with this. Mm. It's really knocked my self-confidence a lot and affected my body image so that I don't go out much anymore. I have to go out to work, obviously, but I sort of keep away from people as much as I can. I think because everyone can see I've got a problem, it stopped me from doing things like playing sports or swimming. I feel lonely most of the time and a bit depressed, if I'm honest. I'm also concerned that I haven't started any treatment at all. I'm hoping that it's not too late now. 
I can appreciate your concerns. Now, what I'd like to do is give you a skin biopsy as soon as possible to see exactly what's going on. I think we can book you in for that early next week. Once we get the results, I'll be able to get you started on some... Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. You hear a doctor talking to a patient. So I have your notes from the sports medicine clinic and it looks as if you've had quite a few problems in recent years. Yeah. Would you like to talk me through them? Okay. Um, well, the first time I got hurt was two years ago. I took a fall while I was rollerblading and I hurt my right wrist here on the side. So I didn't do anything right away. But next day I went and saw the doctor and they gave me an x-ray, but they said they couldn't see anything wrong, and they just gave me some exercises to do. Right. Then a year ago, I hurt my right shoulder here when I came off my snowboard and hurt myself. That's never really gotten better. And I understand you've had about ten visits to the clinic over the last two years. So that's your right wrist and shoulder? Mm-hmm. And other joints, too. Tell me about this pain in your shoulder. Is there anything that makes it feel worse? Well, I like to do a lot of exercise, but that definitely makes it worse. Like if I do a set of pull-ups in the gym or rowing, or if I'm using the free weights, pretty well any sort of exercise I do, I find the pain's pretty bad. Right. And it's not just when I'm in the gym. It's constant all through the day. There's no fluctuation. So I never get a break from it. Mm. It's really got me down and no one seems to know what to do about it. They've diagnosed various different things, and I have to lie on my left side at night, or the pain disturbs my sleep, so that's not easy. Mm. So, apart from that, are you generally in good health? I suppose so. But what I've noticed is that my right wrist sometimes feels cold. Okay. And there's no reason I can see for that. And the same for my left knee. It suddenly goes cold. It's very strange. When I told the doctor about that, he checked to see if the blood flow was okay, and it was. Right. And he asked if I felt any numbness there, but I don't. Okay. That's quite strange. Mm. And uh, have you had any medical problems in the past? Well, the only thing really is um, I used to have really bad acne. It started when I was about 13, and I got it on my face and then it spread to my back, and nothing I did seemed to have any effect on it. Like, first, my mom went to the pharmacy, and she got this stuff I rubbed on. Um, I can't remember the name. It was something peroxide. Benzoyl peroxide? Yeah, that's it. But that didn't do any good, so my mom took me to the doctor, and he gave me antibiotics, and they didn't do much either. Mm. Uh, then I read this article that said it can be caused by your diet and you should cut out dairy products. So I did that for a bit, but it just got worse. And it got so, I didn't want to go out or anything. So then my doctor referred me to the hospital and I saw a dermatologist. Mm -hmm. She was really nice and she prescribed me some stuff that was much stronger and that did have an effect for a bit, but I got really dry lips and they started cracking and bleeding. Okay. And another side effect, well, she said she wasn't sure it was due to the medication, but I think it was. Um, every so often, I started getting this awful depression. So, in the end, I stopped taking anything, and it seems to have sorted itself out. Yes, your skin looks fine now. Right, so let's have a look at this shoulder of yours. Can you... 
That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a dentist discussing booking problems with her receptionist. Hey Kieran, Mr Lau just mentioned that he'd tried to reschedule his appointment yesterday, first online and then when that didn't work he called up, but apparently he couldn't reschedule. Any idea why? Hmm, I wasn't working yesterday, but let me check the notes. So Lana left a note about the call. She says that Mr Lau wanted to reschedule, but we didn't have any other appointments this week after 3pm, which is the only time he could make. He asked if he could make an appointment next week, but his procedure was marked on our system as urgent, so she had to make it in the same week. The system wouldn't have let her reschedule it any later. She wouldn't have had the authorization to change that. Still, she should have discussed this with you at lunch or at the end of the day, because then you could have decided whether it could have been postponed for a week. Yeah. In his circumstance, it would have been fine to reschedule at a slightly later date. We should prevent something like this from happening again. Mm, you're right. I'll talk to her about it tomorrow, and I'll send out an email to everyone else so that they're aware. You hear a doctor discussing chest x-ray information with a medical student. Hey, Dr. Yan, we've got the x-rays back for Mr. Regis in bed 8 from this morning. Great. Can you document them in the notes? Um, do you mind showing me how to write the interpretation properly? Of course. Make sure you put the patient details. Full name, date of birth, patient number, and home address first. Uh -huh. Then put the hospital and ward, date, and time. Make sure your name is on the document, too. Include the indication for the x-ray like uh, hemoptysis or dyspnea before documenting your interpretation. Now, I use a simple mnemonic to make sure I don't miss anything. A, B, C, D, E. Airway. Trachea, carina, bronchi, and the hilar structures. Breathing. Lung fields and pleura. Cardiac. Heart size and heart borders. Diaphragm. Position, shape, and costophrenic angles. Finally, everything else, the mediastinal contours, bones and tubes, or devices. Make sure you document everything clearly using this system in the notes. You hear an ENT surgeon talking to a colleague about cochlear implants. We implant an electrode array which looks like several small wires made of a platinum iridium alloy into different regions of the cochlea. Uh -huh. These metal wires conduct the electrical impulses generated from the microphone, which picks up sound from the environment and sends the signals to the electrode array through a transmitter. There's also a speech processor between the two that filters more important sounds so that the patient can hear people talking rather than other sounds. Right, okay, so does this restore hearing to normal levels? No. With the current technology, we're giving deaf people a good representation of sounds from the environment and help to understand speech. 
Mm. After surgery, patients undergo therapy to relearn the sense of hearing. Not everyone benefits from the device to the same extent. Right. You hear a GP talk about type 2 diabetes mellitus. Hello, I'll be covering the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes mellitus. So, there are four methods that we can use. The first is a fasting plasma glucose test. This is our preferred diagnostic test, as it's easier to carry out, often more convenient, and costs us less than the other three tests. It helps to try and book these appointments in the morning, as the patient has to refrain from eating for at least eight hours before they can take the test. Normal fasting blood glucose will be between 70 and 100 milligrams per deciliter. A value of over 126 milligrams per deciliter indicates a diagnosis of diabetes. Bear in mind that this test should be carried out twice to confirm a positive result. The second method we can use is to measure the average glycemic load over the past three months. You hear a dentist talking to a patient with a chipped tooth. So, we've talked about different options, and it seems like a veneer would be the best treatment. Given the cost of the procedure, are you happy to go ahead? It's quite expensive, but oh, I definitely need to get it fixed. Will it stay put? Veneers tend to need replacing every 10 to 15 years, so they are a long-term solution. It will certainly be more durable than composite bonding, mm. and it will look more realistic too. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's great. And uh, is there anything I can do to extend their lifespan? Well, you need to maintain good oral health. You know, brushing, flossing, regular checkups. <laughs> you should avoid brushing your veneer too hard, as it could cause damage. Okay. You hear a podiatrist talking to a patient with fallen arches. So, you say you're experiencing foot pain. Uh -huh. uh, are you wearing supportive shoes? Uh -huh. I'm wearing appropriate shoes and I'm also wearing orthotics that should be helping, but uh -huh. I'm still experiencing pain in my feet. Um, sometimes they feel a bit numb too. Right, okay. And you mentioned that you've been given some foot exercises to do? Yeah, the physiotherapist I went to showed me those. Um, at first I thought they were helping, but now I think I'm as bad as I've ever been. Uh, is there anything else we can do? That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. You hear a GP called Dr. Georgia Sims giving a presentation on the subject of social prescribing. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 1 to 6.
Hello, my name's Georgia Sims, and I'm a GP working at a practice in a small country town. My special interest is community mental health, and my presentation today is on the subject of what's called social prescribing. I've been involved in a community health project which has been using this and which seems to be making a difference to the well-being of some of my patients. The project was inspired by the recent initiative that encourages GPs to include social prescribing in a patient's therapy. GPs are now able to write a prescription that allows a patient to attend one of a number of activities, each of which focuses on sociability and the feeling of belonging to a community. The activities encourage patients to link in with non-medical sources of support in both indoor and outdoor contexts. When I first heard about social prescribing, I had some concerns, but I was still keen to explore how it might be of help to my patients who suffer from moderate levels of depression and anxiety. I identified three long-term patients who often spoke of loneliness and feelings of isolation in addition to their mental health issues. But I was a little worried that the effect might be to reduce the input of GPs in patient care and cut back on the amount of direct contact GPs have with them. But after reading about various social prescribing projects that had been underway for a while, I realised this wasn't the case. Indeed, I began to see that my having the ability to prescribe a social activity would be helpful to my patients. Although there are several activities that lend themselves to social prescribing, like um, walking or singing in a community choir, I decided to go with a gardening project for several reasons. I'd already been contacted by the manager of a well-established community garden, which is tended by volunteers. Unfortunately, some volunteers had recently moved out of the area and more needed to be recruited. The garden is located close to public transport, which was an important consideration as none of my patients are able to drive for medical reasons. My hope was, of course, that the activity would improve their physical health. I'd previously encouraged them to try keep fit sessions, but this hadn't been a success. But I also hoped that being out in the fresh air in a non-threatening environment would have a positive emotional effect on them too. I was cautiously optimistic about the benefits to my patients of becoming involved in the gardening project. However, I was concerned that the hard work involved in digging a garden might be a daunting prospect for some of them, particularly those who had physical limitations related to health conditions. Um, for example, uh, one patient had undergone knee surgery the previous year and was understandably cautious about digging. Another patient has chronic back pain and was therefore unable to bend or stoop down. It was important to make sure the project manager was aware of their limitations and could tailor the activities to suit the patient's abilities and reassure them that the activities were indeed within their capabilities. After the first month of the project, I spoke to each of the three participants individually and was pleased by their feedback. All reported that they were enjoying an enhanced sense of well-being. They all admitted that when I first talked to them about the gardening project, they'd not expected to enjoy being out in the fresh air as much as they eventually did. This was the most welcome news for me. All other attempts I'd made to get them involved in such activities had been unsuccessful. One patient added that he left the gardening project each week feeling that it was a job well done. And I was very happy to hear that all three felt they had more self-confidence and felt that the future was brighter for them as a result of taking part. It all boded well for initiatives we might go on to set up. Looking back, 
I realised that I'd been unnecessarily sceptical about prescribing activities that were already available in the community. After all, I'd reasoned, people have been able to join all sorts of community projects on their own for a long time. Why would a GP's prescription make a difference? Something that one patient said, however, brought home to me the value of social prescribing. When I asked him how he felt about being involved in the gardening project, he said, Without your gentle push, I'd never have considered it. When I asked him to explain, he said that it was like any other prescription I gave him for his condition. He trusted my expertise and viewed my social prescription as another part of his treatment. This, above all, has convinced me that social prescribing is a valuable addition to a range of mental health therapies. Now look at extract two. You hear an interview with a physician called Dr. Tadita Hussain, who's talking about treating patients with cystic fibrosis. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Cystic fibrosis is a condition that causes mucus to be thicker and stickier than it should be. Dr. Tadida Hussain specializes in cystic fibrosis treatment and is here to share her thoughts on caring for people with the condition. Tadida, can you tell us a bit more about patients who suffer from cystic fibrosis? Absolutely. Sufferers tend to carry two to five times as much salt in their bodies as those without the condition, mm -hmm. so you can see why their mucus is thicker than average. Treatment for these patients is usually quite time consuming and repetitive. Patients are often required to stay in hospital for long stretches. And as the symptoms of the condition begin to present very early on in the patient's life, many of my patients are young people. And so we tend to see lots of patients with cystic fibrosis finding these hospital visits frustrating. Right. 
In fact, throughout the UK, about 80% of patients with cystic fibrosis who are hospitalised report feeling at least minimal levels of depression. How about young patients who aren't currently hospitalised? What can be challenging about their treatment? Well, patients can be required to take around 30 pills a day to keep cystic fibrosis under control. So it's understandable that teenagers and young people who just want to be free and independent might resent this ordeal if they think they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. One of the most difficult things we have to contend with is the fact that if patients stop taking their medication or doing their daily breathing treatments, their condition won't immediately worsen. Instead, it will gradually become more severe until they contract a serious infection, which puts their lives at risk. So what approaches do you use when treating patients with cystic fibrosis? Well, we've found distraction therapy to be extremely useful. We're incredibly lucky to have received a donation of a number of virtual reality headsets following their success in a number of treatment trials. We use the virtual reality headsets to transport the patient to outdoor settings, often corresponding to the activities they're required to do with us. When they complete breathing exercises on a stationary bike, for example, mm -hmm. the VR headsets display a virtual outdoor bike ride. Our patients find it helpful to pretend to be somewhere else during treatment, and it's often easier for us to administer breathing treatments to patients using these headsets, as they're more relaxed when they're not focused on the actuality of the test. So, what sorts of changes have you seen in your patients as a result of these methods? One of my patients, a 24-year-old man with cystic fibrosis who was in hospital waiting for a lung transplant, well, he found treatment very difficult at first. He was preoccupied by his need for a transplant and frustrated by feelings of powerlessness. He would often resist treatment. We started using the virtual reality systems with him as soon as we got them, and it took a while for him to get on board, but when he did, it was like someone had breathed new life into him. Not only did he stop hindering his treatment, he actually began to look forward to it. He's even started helping us to think about other ways we can improve the experiences of our patients, like improving social interaction. Ah, uh, yes, I understand that there are difficulties involved in patient communication. Mm. We're looking into the possibility of instant messaging functions between patients, and even virtual games that they can play against each other. Unfortunately, patients with cystic fibrosis have to be kept apart to avoid cross-infection. It's just one more cross to bear for our patients, that they can't talk to those going through the same thing. Right. Our patients get plenty of interaction with myself and the rest of the staff, but we'd like to make sure they have access to a network of fellow sufferers too, for support and advice. I see. That all sounds quite futuristic. Are there any other advances on the horizon for the treatment of cystic fibrosis? Well, there's a new drug that's been in the news recently. It's a combination of Lumacafta and Ivacafta. You might know it by the brand name Orkambi. The drug works by improving the level of water and salt in the body, thereby reducing the thick mucus that causes illness and respiratory issues in those with cystic fibrosis. Even more exciting and futuristic, though, is the possibility of gene therapy, where the genetic mutation that causes cystic fibrosis in individuals is replaced with a healthy gene. This would effectively cure those with the condition and significantly extend the lives of thousands of people and remove the need for lengthy stays in hospital. 